Okay, so are you ready to get a little intense today? Oh, always up for a challenge. We're diving into some excerpts from, well, let's just say, a religious text that really goes all in on this idea of spiritual warfare. Fire and brimstone stuff? You could say that, mm -hmm. but uh, it's surprisingly practical, too, like woven into all the, you know, the heavy stuff. Intriguing. What kind of text are we talking about here? It's one that... Um, really doesn't hold back when it comes to talking about the devil. Calls him a straight-up murderer, a liar, no sugarcoating. Wow, getting right to the point, huh? Right. And at first, I have to admit, I was kind of like, whoa, this is intense. But then I started thinking, you know, what if it's not just about a literal devil with horns and a pitchfork? Okay, I'm listening. What if it's a metaphor, you know? <laughs> For all those negative forces we wrestle with, like internally, those... Um, those inner demons that tempts it to make bad choices. I mean, we've all got those, right? Oh, absolutely. That's a really interesting way to look at it. And that's what's so fascinating about this text. It uses such strong language. But when you start to dig deeper, there's this whole other layer of meaning. So how does the text define the devil exactly? I mean, beyond those strong terms you mentioned. Well, it talks about the devil being the source of all evil, like the ultimate bad guy. And it uses murderer metaphorically to describe what happens when we're separated from God. Separated from God, so like a spiritual death. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But think about it this way. What dies when we constantly give in to our worst impulses, you know, like our potential, our dreams? It's almost like we're slowly killing off our best selves bit by bit. Whoa, yeah. That's deep. It is, isn't it? And yeah. that's what's so powerful about this text. It's not just some abstract theological concept. It's about the very real struggle we all face, trying to be our best selves in a world that's constantly trying to pull us down. It's like we're in this constant battle for our best selves. And the devil, whatever that represents for us personally, is yeah. like trying to sabotage us at every turn. And the text gets very specific about how the devil does that, you know? It talks about him using lies and deception to tempt us, to lead us astray. Yeah, that whole idea of temptation. Yeah. It says the devil tries to t trick us with these really common lies, like it won't matter if I do it just once or no one will ever know. Oh, those are so familiar. We've all fallen for those at some point, haven't we? Right. It's like he knows exactly what buttons to push. It's true. Like, when I convince myself that just one more episode before bed won't hurt, even though I know I'll be exhausted in the morning. Or when I tell myself that one more cookie won't hurt, even though I'm, like, trying to eat healthy. Exactly. It's those little whispers of temptation that can really get us into trouble. So the text is saying we need to be super aware of those internal whispers. Like, recognize them for what they are. Lies designed to trip us up. That's exactly it. Awareness is the first step, for sure. But what happens when we do mess up? Mm -hmm. Because we all do, right? Yeah. I mean, nobody's perfect. We all slip up sometimes. So what does this text say about dealing with those moments when we give in to temptation? Well, that's where things get really interesting. The text talks about the importance of confession and seeking forgiveness. Okay. So it's not just about feeling bad about messing up. You have to actually de-do something about it. That's the idea. Now, in this specific faith, confession involves admitting your wrongdoing to God and asking for forgiveness. But even if you take that out of the religious context, there's something powerful about acknowledging our mistakes. So it's like hitting the reset button. We admit we messed up, and then we can move forward without carrying all that baggage. You got it. It's like a weight lifted off your shoulders. Mm. And you know what? That idea of confessing, even outside of religion, has real-world parallels. Oh, yeah, totally. Like, think about therapy, right? Exactly. Or even just apologizing to someone we've wronged. Owning up to our mistakes is a huge part of personal growth, no matter what you believe. Okay, so we've got this idea of being aware of those lies and then confessing when we stumble. But how do we actually fight back? The text keeps talking about resisting the devil, but what does that actually look like, mm -hmm. like in real life? Right. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Well, there's this one verse that really sums it up. It says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, submission. That sounds kind of intense, doesn't it? It does, right? Like blind obedience or something. Yeah, not exactly empowering. But what if we reframe it a little? Think about those self-help gurus who talk about surrendering to the process. When you commit to a fitness goal, a new habit, you're basically submitting to something bigger than your immediate desires. Right. So it's about aligning yourself with something that will ultimately benefit you, even if it means making some sacrifices in the short term. You got it. And in the context of this text, that something bigger is God. 
But even if you take out the religious aspect, the principle holds true. Think about it, setting goals, self-discipline, prioritizing your values. Those are all forms of submission in a secular sense. You're choosing to resist those temptations that pull you away from what you really want. So like resisting that urge to scroll through social media when you have a deadline? Exactly. It's about making the hard choices, the ones that align with your values, even when they're not the easy or fun choices. Gotcha. So resisting the devil isn't always about some epic showdown. It can be about those small everyday choices that move us closer to our goals. You nailed it. And that brings us to the last part of that verse. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So the more we stand our ground, the weaker those negative forces become. Exactly. It speaks to the power of willpower, of conscious choice. The more we act in accordance with our values, the less power those temptations have over us. It's like they can't get a foothold. So it's not just about hoping for the best, but actively pushing back against those forces that try to pull us down. You got it. And the text actually takes it a step further. It talks about Christ's victory over Satan and how that victory gives us strength. It's like saying, look, the ultimate battle has already been won. You have access to that power. Wait, so we're talking about divine backup here. Like Christ defeated the ultimate bad guy and now we get to share in that victory. Exactly. And this idea of drawing strength from a belief system, from a community that shares those beliefs, it's something that resonates across cultures and throughout history. It's like having a whole army of support behind you, even when you're facing your own personal battles. Precisely. It's about finding those sources of strength, whether they're religious, secular, or a mix of both, that help us stay resilient no matter what life throws our way. That's pretty amazing. But I gotta ask, if Christ already won the war, why do we still have to fight these individual battles? What's the point? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And it's one that we're going to unpack further in the next part of our deep dive. Welcome back. All right. So we left off with this big question. If, you know, if good has already triumphed in this cosmic sense, why are we still stuck fighting these inner battles? It's like, what's the point? It's a question that's been debated for, well, a very long time. And honestly, there are no easy answers. But I think this text offers some interesting perspectives on how to approach those struggles, even within the context of this idea of ultimate victory. Okay, so it's not like we just get to sit back and relax and let the cosmic forces take care of everything. Not exactly. It's more like we've been given this incredible potential, this inner strength, but it's up to us to actually use it. So we've got to put in the work. Exactly. And that's where all those strategies we talked about earlier come in connecting with something greater than ourselves, building a strong community, developing self-awareness, practicing forgiveness. Those are the tools that help us access that power and navigate life's challenges. It's like we've been handed a map, but we still have to walk the path ourselves. That's a great way to put it. And the text offers some pretty specific guidance on how to do that. One of the key things it emphasizes is staying connected to God through practices like prayer and meditation, as well as immersing yourself in scripture. So in a more secular sense, that could be like having a daily mindfulness practice or journaling or even just spending time in nature. Anything that helps you reconnect with your values and find a sense of peace. Absolutely. It's about creating a consistent practice that nourishes your spirit and reminds you of what truly matters. It's like taking time to recharge your batteries so you have the energy to face those inevitable challenges. Exactly. And another key theme that runs throughout the text is the importance of community. It talks about surrounding yourself with like-minded individuals who share your beliefs and aspirations. You know, it's funny how often we come back to this idea of community. It seems like no matter what the topic is, having a strong support system is always crucial. It makes sense, right? We're social creatures. We thrive when we feel connected, when we have people who understand and support us on our journeys. Absolutely. And I imagine in the context of this text, that sense of community is even more important. It's like having a group of people who are all committed to the same goal, who can offer encouragement and accountability when things get tough. Exactly. They can remind you of your values when you start to lose sight of them. They can celebrate your victories with you and offer support when you stumble. It's incredibly powerful. It's like having a cheerleading squad for your soul. I love that. And you know, the text even suggests that this sense of community extends beyond our immediate circle. It encourages acts of service and compassion towards all beings, emphasizing that our well-being is interconnected. So it's about recognizing that we're all part of something bigger than ourselves. 
that our actions have a ripple effect on the world around us. Precisely. And that awareness can be incredibly motivating, inspiring us to live a life that contributes to the well-being of others. Okay, so we've got connection to something greater than ourselves, community. What else does this text suggest in terms of tools for navigating those inner battles? Well, another crucial element is self-awareness. The text really stresses the importance of recognizing our own weaknesses, those areas where we're most vulnerable to temptation. So it's about knowing your triggers, right? Like, <laughs> okay, when I'm stressed, I tend to reach for sugary snacks or... When I'm feeling lonely, I'm more likely to make impulsive decisions. Exactly. And once you're aware of those patterns, you can start to develop strategies for dealing with them in a healthier way. Maybe you need to find new ways to manage stress, or maybe you need to cultivate deeper connections to combat loneliness. It's about being proactive instead of reactive. Exactly. And speaking of being proactive, the text also talks about the importance of discernment, of developing a critical eye that can distinguish truth from falsehood. It's like having a BS detector that goes off whenever you encounter something that doesn't feel quite right. I like that. It's about questioning those messages, those beliefs, those temptations that don't align with your values. It's about developing a healthy skepticism and learning to trust your gut. That makes so much sense. But, you know, even with the best BS detector, we're all going to fall for those tricks sometimes. We're all going to uh -huh. make mistakes. So how do we deal with that guilt and shame? Well, the text offers a really powerful antidote to those feelings, nah. forgiveness. It emphasizes the importance of confession, of acknowledging our wrongdoings and seeking forgiveness from God, as well as from ourselves and others. So it's about recognizing that we're all imperfect beings who are capable of making mistakes, but that those mistakes don't define us. Exactly. And holding on to that guilt and shame only keeps us stuck in the past. Forgiveness allows us to learn from our mistakes and move forward. It's like hitting the reset button and giving ourselves permission to try again. Exactly. And the text goes even further, suggesting that we extend that same forgiveness to others who have wronged us. It argues that holding on to anger and resentment only harms us in the long run. So it's about letting go of that baggage, recognizing that everyone is fighting their own battles, and choosing compassion over judgment. Beautifully said. And along with forgiveness, the text also highlights the power of gratitude. It suggests that cultivating a grateful heart can be a powerful weapon against negativity and temptation. I can see how that would be helpful. When you're focused on all the good things in your life, it's harder to get bogged down by the negative. Exactly. And gratitude isn't just about feeling good. It's about shifting your perspective, choosing to focus on the positive, even when things are tough. And that shift in mindset can have a profound impact on your well-being. It's like choosing to see the glass half full instead of half empty. Exactly. And along with gratitude, the text also encourages us to cultivate humility, recognizing that we don't have all the answers and that we're always learning and growing. It's about being open to new perspectives, willing to admit when we're wrong, and embracing the journey of lifelong learning. Precisely. And that humility allows us to connect with others on a deeper level, to learn from their experiences, and to grow in wisdom and compassion. So we've got connection, community, self-awareness, forgiveness, gratitude, humility. It sounds like we're building quite a toolkit here for navigating life's challenges. Yeah. What else does this text offer? Well, one thing that really stands out is the emphasis on action. This text isn't about passively waiting for things to get better. It's about actively engaging in the process of growth and transformation. So it's not just about thinking good thoughts or having good intentions, but about actually putting those thoughts and intentions into action. Exactly. It's about making choices that align with your values, whether that's choosing to spend time with positive people or breaking free from an unhealthy habit. It's about taking ownership of your life and choosing to create the reality you want to experience. Absolutely, and that's where the real power lies. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. We've explored the text's perspective on the devil, temptation, and the ongoing battle we face, even within the context of Christ's victory. And we've delved into a whole toolbox of strategies for navigating those challenges, connecting to something greater than ourselves, building community, developing self-awareness, practicing forgiveness, embracing gratitude and humility, and taking action to align our lives with our values. It's been a pretty comprehensive exploration, and I think there's something in here for everyone, regardless of their spiritual beliefs. I agree. And you know, what I find really interesting is that even though this text is rooted in a specific religious tradition, the themes we've been discussing, things like resilience, self-awareness, compassion, 
Those are universal human values. You're right. These are ideas that resonate across cultures and throughout history. And I think that's why this text continues to be so relevant, even for people who don't subscribe to its specific religious teachings. It's like we're tapping into something fundamental about the human experience, the struggle to be our best selves, the search for meaning and purpose, the desire for connection and belonging. Exactly. And I think that's what makes this exploration so fascinating. It allows us to engage with these profound questions in a way that's both intellectually stimulating and personally meaningful. All right. So we're back and ready to wrap up our deep dive into this, well, this pretty intense look at spiritual warfare. We've talked about the devil, we've talked about temptation, those inner battles we all face. But now I think it's time to shift gears a bit and talk about hope. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. This is where the text moves from, you know, those practical strategies to something much bigger, much grander. Okay, so what are we talking about here? It's about this idea of victory that's already been won, like the ultimate victory. Through Christ defeating Satan. Ex okay, but here's the thing, right? We've talked about how we still have to fight these battles, make choices, resist temptation, all that. So if good has already triumphed, mm -hmm. like cosmically, what's the point of all our effort? It seems kind of, I don't know, pointless. That's a great question. And, you know, honestly, it's something that's puzzled people for centuries. Yeah, I can see why. It's like, what are we even doing here? Right. But the text seems to be saying that even though this ultimate victory has been secured, that doesn't mean we get to just, you know, sit back and relax and let everything take care of itself. We still have to actively choose to, like, walk the path of goodness. So it's not a free pass. Not exactly. It's more like we've been given the keys to this like amazing super powered car, but we still have to get behind the wheel and learn how to drive it. Okay. I like that analogy. Yeah. That makes sense. We've got all this potential, this incredible power available to us. Yeah. But it's up to us to actually tap into it. Exactly. And that's where all those strategies we talked about earlier come in, right? Connecting with something bigger than ourselves, building community, self awareness, forgiveness, all that. You got it. Those are the tools that help us actually harness that power, learn how to steer that car, if you will, and like navigate the road ahead. So it's not just about passively waiting for some kind of cosmic reward. Right. It's about actively participating in our own spiritual growth, using the tools that we've been given. Exactly. It's about making choices every day that reflect that victory that's, you know, already been won. It's about living a life that's aligned with our values, even when it's tough. I mean, nobody's perfect. So it's more about progress than perfection, like yeah. constantly striving to be better, to make choices that, you know, reflect the good that's already inside of us. You nailed it. And that process of striving, of like constantly choosing good over evil, that's what strengthens our connection to the ultimate source of goodness, whatever that means for us. OK, that makes sense. But I still kind of wonder, like, why even bother if the big battle's already been won? Why all these little skirmishes? What's the point? Hmm. That's a good question. Think of it this way. Imagine you're training for a marathon, right? You know that finish line exists, but you still have to run every single mile, push through the pain, build up your endurance. So it's not just about the destination. It's about the journey, too, like the transformation that happens along the way. The growth. Exactly. And that's what this text seems to be arguing. Like, the transformation is the whole point. Through our choices, our struggles, our moments of, you know, victory and defeat, we become more than we were before. We learn, we grow, we become more resilient. Exactly. And we tap into a strength that we maybe didn't even know we had. Okay, I can see that. It's like we're being forged anew through these experiences. Like a blacksmith hammering a piece of metal into a beautiful and useful tool. Wow, that's a powerful image. Yeah, just kind of came to me. And that's the beauty of this whole, you know, belief system. It doesn't shy away from the tough stuff, the hardships, the temptations, the darkness. But it ultimately offers this message of hope. Of resilience. Of, like, coming out stronger on the other side. You got it. And that message can be incredibly empowering. It is. It is. It's like, hey, life is tough, but you've got this. You have the power within you. And the support of something greater than yourself. To overcome anything. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's a good message to end on. So, you know, we've really dug deep into some pretty profound ideas today, haven't we? From those everyday temptations to this grand cosmic battle between good and evil. And we explored a whole bunch of strategies for navigating those challenges, drawing strength from our beliefs, building community, being more self-aware, practicing forgiveness, embracing gratitude and humility. And taking action, 
like not just sitting around waiting for things to happen, but actually making choices that move us closer to our goals, to the kind of person we want to be. Mm -hmm. So to our listener out there, we hope you've enjoyed this deep dive. Whether you approach these ideas from a spiritual perspective or a secular one, we hope you found something here that resonates with you. Absolutely. Keep exploring, keep growing, and keep striving to become the best version of yourself. And until next time, keep those minds curious and those spirits bright.